brioche comes in a lot of shapes and sizes, if you will. Um, the most rich brioche has like egg as the only hydration. So the liquid in the egg is your water. In this case, it's a combination of milk and egg that's creating the hydration for this loaf. Um, and this is because I'm trying to make a, a versatile roll. So I don't really want the cakey result that would come from just using egg instead of water. Having the milk in there will uh, make for a little bit more of a stable overall dough. Um, so the ingredients are our, um, our blend of flour that has some heritage grains and some white flour in it. We've got butter, egg, sugar, milk, salt, and our sourdough starter. So whenever I work with egg in, in doughs, you can sort of look at it the same way as uh, water. So I'm gonna start with cracking these four eggs and getting the milk together, and that's like my, my hydration. So we will put in the amount of water that I need, or milk that I need. Things to keep in mind when you have an enriched dough like this, sugar can be problematic getting it into the dough. Um, if the sugar, uh, the sugar and the flour and the hydration all sort of mix together improperly, you can get a really strange result. Uh, so I'm going to leave the sugar and the salt out for a moment and add those later on along with butter. I am going to go ahead and add my starter now. So I only need a small amount. I'm used to working with much larger amounts. So we'll see if I can get this out in the right amount. So basically I've got all my liquid items in now and we're going to go to flour. This mixer works a lot like the middle range one that we have. Uh, and hopefully I have enough material for this mixer. I'm like right on the line, but my five quarts inside, so it's gonna have to work. So we're incorporating this now. Uh, meanwhile, while that's going, I'm gonna press this butter out. I don't need all of this. This is a half a stick. And because I'm making a very small batch today, I, this is even too much. So, but it's cold. And one of the tricks that we've learned is that you can take cold butter and press it. Normally I press like four blocks at a time. So it's again, sort of strange to be working in this smaller increment. But now this butter is basically already soft. So it'll be a lot easier to work with. I'm gonna go ahead and portion this out for myself now too. You definitely don't wanna put in cold butter into your mixes. Uh, by the time you get to the butter stage, it's uh, considered an emulsifier. And I like to think of it as you're, you're basically like kind of lubricating the final dough. So you get the dough like really well developed and then you add your butter, butter in at the end. So because this mixer is a little bit big for the amount of dough that I'm mixing, I need to do a better job of scraping down the sides. I'm just gonna come in here and scrape the sides down. I remember in a previous video that I talked about not wanting to become the baker that's only in here once a week. And the thing is once like we got to building this new bakery, I'm lucky to get once a week that I'm actually baking. Um, uh, there's just a lot to do with uh, building out a whole new space. Uh, we, we're about a month in right now, and so we are through architecture and through engineering. We're actually submitting our city, our plans to the city, I think, today. Um, and so really, like, every day for me in the last month has been 
phone calls with contractors, phone calls with architects, engineers, site visits, uh, deciding what equipment's gonna be necessary, deciding on finances and budget, and all these things that have nothing to do with actually making any bread. Uh, and so it's a, a little bit of a change of pace for me, but it's temporary too. I, I'm excited to uh, jump back in a little bit more once we get into the new space. And it'll be strange because we actually have some new faces around here that have barely worked with me um, in terms of baking. Uh, uh, our longest standing uh, employee, Dylan, is now uh, managing the production um, and responsible for making sure that this side of our business continues to thrive while we essentially create a whole new infrastructure for ourselves. Um, so it's a big task on him, but he's been doing a really good job in freeing up my time to be able to create this new building, um, which otherwise, like just kind of going backwards in time, had we had to do this a year ago or two years ago, it would have been catastrophic in nature because there would have been no real way for me to step away enough from here to get the work done. I mean, it was hard enough to keep up with our house uh, in the first year. Uh, we were in here 16, 20 hour days quite regularly and whenever there was something wrong in the house, like, um, you know, we have really intense summers here and the first year that we had the bakery, one of my air conditioners failed. It was really rough to try to find the time, just the time to get that sorted out. Uh, we had we had that situation for much longer than I think a normal household would just because we're so wrapped in our new business. Um, so, but that's just part of the, the difficulty, I, I suppose, uh, sometimes. So I still have a couple ingredients that I need to get in here. I'm gonna need one more container, actually. Uh, I got sugar, salt, and butter that I need to still incorporate. And you can see now the dough is coming together Although that dough hook is barely pulling it, and I'm, I'm tempted to run inside and get my five quart, which I think I will just because. So even though this is a test batch for us, uh, strikes me that this is probably a similar size batch that most of you would be making at home. This will make 12, or sorry, 10 brioche rolls. Uh, so because they're rolls and we scale them to 120 uh, grams, this only it's only 1.2 kilos of dough and uh, I'm so almost unfamiliar with this batch size that I just went for my smallest production mixer thinking oh well, I mean that's that's the right one but I didn't do the math like really um, this 20 quart mixer is good for more like five kilos of dough uh, up to about 12 or 13 and I was trying to run it with only one kilo of dough uh, which the five quart is beyond sufficient so if you have a if you have a KitchenAid at home this will be a good opportunity for us to work on probably the same exact uh, equipment so you can see this dough is already coming together I'm gonna put it in the bowl so these bowl scrapers are really good for getting the ends. I'm not gonna go too fast. I'm gonna set it to what is speed three. So for me, that's probably about equivalent to the second speed in this mixer. I don't really like going much faster than this on, um, on bread doughs. I might go up to four on this mixer uh, as kind of the fastest speed, which is here and I would be really reluctant to mix bread dough much faster than this on a regular basis. Maybe I'll feel differently in the future. My spiral only goes into its first speed, so um, I'm used to developing doughs kind of at a slower pace. I probably look a little bit like a fish out of water with such small batches, it's just not. And it's so weird to think about because you guys are looking at this and thinking, 10 rolls about all I probably make at home for myself. For us, it's just our entire life has been bigger batches. So this is just a, a weird thing. 
So now that this dough is uh, way more developed, I feel a lot safer about in incorporating the sugar. So I'm gonna incorporate it in small amounts, split this up into a couple different inclusions. It looks to be taken pretty well though. The whole key here is you don't want the addition of sugar to hinder your gluten development. If you were to add it with the liquid and the flour, it can clump together and form these like hydrated streaks of, of sugar syrup through your dough. And when you get to that stage, it's really hard to work that out. Like it, the sugar seems to crystallize or something. I don't really know the science behind what's happening, but uh, once that happens, it's a little bit, a little bit of a rough situation. So that's why I like to more to get my mix a little fully developed uh, or more fully developed before I add sugar to it. So we're gonna let this go for just a moment, try to return to some of the strength that we had before, and then it will be time to add the last ingredient, which is the butter. I'm judging the whole time to see how well that the dough is pulling away from the bowl. Right now it's kind of stuck at the very bottom, um, which just before I added the sugar, it wasn't. So the sugar has broken down the structure of the gluten a little bit, and now it's sort of rebuilding strength. I'm gonna to try to get it to the point that again, I see that it's pulling away a little bit more before I add the butter if I can. Uh, my, my comfort level and familiarity with the five quart mixer is much lesser than the bigger mixers. And so, uh, so as I'm watching the dough form in this, I've just watched so, so much fewer doughs developed in this bowl versus in the others. And even though it's essentially the same style mixer, it's still a little bit different. Um, like the, the shape of the bowl and the shape of the dough hook and where it comes down to, each of these brands have slightly different features of how low the dough hook sits in the bowl and how it interacts. So I'm, I'm having to watch this one a little bit more closely than say if I did a bigger batch in my bigger mixer. But I'm noticing that the, that the gluten is starting to strengthen again moderately. You might not really be able to tell from your vantage point, but starting to pull away a little bit on the sides. And I'm not quite satisfied yet with it. You can see that, that if I try to pull it apart, it's breaking really easily. So that's just points that it's not that strong of a dough yet. Uh, once we build a little bit of that gluten strength is the time that I like to add butter. When we work in a sourdough bakery, we're working on dozens of products simultaneously. Uh, so you, know, you see like cranberry fillings being worked on. Meanwhile, meanwhile, there's doughs being mixed in that mixer. There's croissants being laminated. Uh, there's things being cooked on a, I think the cranberries are being cooked down over there. And so there's a lot of moving parts going on. Um, it's not, this is not like a studio kitchen where we're working on just this one thing. Um, so our daily life is trying to layer all of these various things in all at the same time. Sometimes it can feel a little bit more chaotic than a home kitchen uh, would be, but, but this is not a home kitchen. One of the sucky things about using the wrong mixer to start is now I have two mixers to clean instead of one, which such is life. All right, let's see where we're at here. Okay, so now this dough is pulling away from the bowls. It's very evident how, how much stronger it's gotten. There's no dough sticking at the bottom of the bowl anymore. And so that's my cue that it's time for butter. And it will show too, it, now it's not really breaking when I'm stretching it. A lot more strength than just a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna add this butter in and I'm gonna put it back onto a lower speed and let it kind of coast in there. I might need to put it in the right spot so it just immediately starts to incorporate. So I'm gonna do the same kind of thing with the butter as I did with the sugar and salt. Uh, I'm gonna let it go in, which will first weaken the dough. You can see that the dough's already beginning to uh, behave a little bit differently uh, on the top there where the butter's folding in. Uh, 
So this is temporary, and so the butter is going to fully incorporate. And then, as you, once it's once I no longer am seeing butter, I'm going to bring it back into the third speed, and build the same amount of strength that I just built before the butter was in. And that's when I know that my mix will be complete. The only other thing I'll need to be looking at is the temperature of the mix at the end, making sure that it's warm enough. I imagine that some of you are not so comfortable like handling all these ingredients just with your hands, but the more you bake, the more you deal with all kinds of ingredients in your hands all the time. And dough is sticky and difficult to work with. And so the raw ingredients are also a little bit easier to deal with that way uh, after you've gotten used to that. All right, so the butter is now fully incorporated. So I'm gonna kick it up into that higher speed. I'm in three right now. And I think that's where I'm gonna stay. I might kick it up into four once I uh, get a temperature reading. I'm looking for a result of like mid 80s if I can, although it's such a small amount of dough that the moment that it comes out of the bowl, it's gonna cool down. It's not necessarily good for us today where we're trying to get that bulk fermentation to happen in the mid 80s. Uh, for that, I'm probably going to see whether my walk-in is set up as a proofer or a walk-in right now. If it's set up as a proofer, then I can just put the dough in here and it will stay warm. And it is, it's 80 degrees in there. So that's where the dough is gonna go to live uh, once I'm done with it. The other thing I need is to find a smaller bowl. We'll use this one. There's really no need to do anything to lubricate your, your bowl for brioche. There's already enough like butter in the dough that, that the dough stays pretty loose. It's also not really the type of dough that you have to fold. So it's really just more about it getting its three and a half, four hours of bulk fermentation at a reasonable temperature. If we let the temperature of this drop to room temperature or lower, uh, it's, it's not going to ferment and uh, as fast at least. And that's a big deal with sourdough where you know, yeast is forgiving. There's so high of a colony of natural, of yeast in baker's yeast and a block of baker's yeast. Whereas in sourdough, you're really having to tease out all that natural wild yeast that's in the sourdough starter and make sure that it's uh, multiplying um, literally by the billions. Um, if you drop the temperature too far on your mixes, you just won't get the activity level that you need. So, now that this butter's been spinning for a little while, you can see how that this one is also coming together. I'm now in fourth speed, which like I said, is about as fast as I ever go for bread dough. And it's still sticking there at the bottom, but in the next couple minutes, I imagine that that sticking will, will no longer be. It will be more of a cohesive unit. And let's take a look at temperature really quick. Let's get a temperature reading in Fahrenheit. This is good. I'm at 80 degrees and I'm kind of getting close to the end of my mix. Since the gluten is pretty well formed at this point, uh, and the dough is stronger, the temperature is going to climb more in the last stages of this mix than it did in the initial stages. So it'll be easier for me to get that last few degrees that I'm looking for. Uh, than it would have been to get from say 60 degrees all the way up to 80 initially when it was just water and flour and whatnot. A lot of people always ask too um, how the doughs come out so silky and, and stretchy out of the mixer. Really it's, it's are you getting the gluten development? Uh, you can think of gluten as the, well it's a protein that forms when flour and water come together and it's kind of like a web. Uh, so when it first starts forming, you get like a few strands of that web. And then the web just gets stronger and stronger in layers. Uh, eventually that web starts to disintegrate and break down if you mix too long. That's what people refer to as over mixing. But I found that a lot of people out there uh, in the baking community, especially the home baking community, are really afraid of over mixing. And they don't need to be. Like it's. It's pretty hard to overmix a dough. 
I think it's a lot harder than people think. And so it's something that people are fearful of that I would say it's not something you really need to worry about too much. If I walked away for the next 20 minutes, then maybe I would start to see that happening here. But I mean, if, if you're baking in such a way that you're setting your mixer and then you're going away for an hour, then you're probably not that invested in, in your baking to begin with. And, and maybe, maybe it's not a hobby you should take up. But if you're engaged in baking, like I imagine most of you are, over mixing is just, frankly, should be like the least of your worries. It's just hard to do. Now, I don't typically auto lease an enriched dough like this. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for that. First of all, the hydration is lower. Uh, and so the benefits of the auto lease are, are also lower. Um, but there's still the proper order of operations. And you saw that the, the liquid goes in first along with the eggs and the starter just flour at first, you get that to nice development, and then you start adding the other stuff, the sugar uh, and the butter in particular, um, and making sure those get added slowly. So I'm pretty happy with this now. Let's get a temperature reading. And now I'm up to 83 degrees. Just in those last couple minutes of mixing, I gained those last three degrees. So at this point, I'll drop this bowl and you're gonna to get to see this brioche coming out. A dough scraper would probably help me. I'm just gonna rely on my hands. See, it's nice and strong coming out of the mixer. Time will still develop it some more. Uh, brioche can benefit also from some kneading, so might do some little kneading to this later to build some more strength. And then this will be divided up into 120 gram rolls. Um, this still has a long way to go. We don't, it's the beginning of our week, so we don't have any other batches that are later on in the stage. So I'll just sort of describe what happens from this point forward. After a three and a half hour bulk fermentation, I'm gonna take this, turn it over on the table and divide it into 120 gram rolls, which I will then roll up into into balls. Uh, at that point, this will enter into its final proof. And if there's one bit of advice for sourdough proofing is just like the croissants, really push it to the max. Uh, so we're looking for the rolls on the trays to expand out almost to their to their max. You want to leave a little bit of gas in the tank for the oven spring, but if you consider like the amount that a roll can expand from, from shaping to the final roll, uh, you wanna get like 60, 70, maybe even 80% of the way there in the final proof and leave just the last bit for the oven for sourdough. And I think that that changes if you're using baker's yeast, but for sourdough, that's what has led to the fluffiest buns. And, and it's very easy to make a sourdough bun that's dense uh, if you underproof it. The typical culprit is just not giving it enough of a final proof. So this, this dough, you can see that it's brioche and how like rich and kind of that cream yellow color you can see. There's no water in this dough. It's milk and eggs that are creating um, the, the hydration for it. So it's, um, it's decadent. Uh, and yeah, these ingredients are real. If you're buying rolls from the store, again, you're not getting like the real thing. You're not getting the real egg and the real butter often. You're getting odd byproducts and substitutes that are cheaper for the, the, the major industrial players to produce. But that's one of the reasons why you get to pay such a small price for those rolls from the store is you're not actually getting to eat real butter and real milk, and real eggs here like, like this dough is. This is just standard old school and rich dough. A uh, little bit of interesting bread history. Back in the day, what we think of as an artisan loaf of bread uh, today, like the artisan sourdough that we make, it's historic cousin would have been like a regular person's bread. Um, and rolls that were enriched like this were really reserved for wealthy people. 
Uh, what's interesting is today the inverse is almost true where uh, people buying these artisan loaves are often the ones that are you know, wanting to spend a little bit more on food and bread. And meanwhile, everybody eats enriched bread in every single product out there. You go to a fast food drive through and you know, it's an enriched bread, although it's likely enriched with vegetable oil instead of, uh, instead of butter, eggs, and milk. Uh, but nonetheless, we've sort of inverted the way that bread used to be made where rolls were really reserved for the rich. And you've got these like giant big breads as like a commoner and because they were giant and they were baked in you know an older school less advanced oven you know wood-fired oven they had to bake them really really dark so that the whole thing baked all the way through we would have been using completely whole wheat flour uh, so it's denser flour bakes a little slower and so the outside would have been pretty much charred so people actually the idea of of removing the crust is not all that foreign to the way that bread was eaten because this black crust would have been chipped away at and then you would have eaten the insides of that flour, water, and salt. Meanwhile, your, um, your rich lords of the town would have had something like this in, in roll form to, to enjoy. So we're also bringing out this enriched roll uh, dough for the holiday season and our customers are gonna enjoy rolls all month now. Uh, uh, for for the month of November here, so that's that's brioche dough in the mixer.